Good morning, Norman. Dude, I want to start things off today with one simple question. And that is, if coffee or tea were invented today, I think they would label it a, a, a psychedelic and we would never get it. Do you agree with that? <laughs> Absolutely. Probably. The times are so crazy. Norman, I mean, I, I'm so shocked by, by, by this book. And the reason why I am is because why haven't I heard about this? Uh, because, I mean, I mean, you, you talk about Nazi Germany, the CIA, and the dawn of the psychedelic age. I've, I've never heard of this. Well, I mean, I'm actually the first person to uncover in this in this very book um, the connection between um, the Swiss the Swiss um, company Sandos, who invented LSD, and the Nazi regime, where the leading biochemist uh, was the best friend of the CEO of the Swiss company. So this, the Nazi knew what was being, you know, discovered um, in 1943 in Basel, uh, which was the strongest um, substance that was acting on the human mind and the nazi biochemist richard kuhn was his name became very interested in it it wasn't easy to uncover this i had to spend uh, quite a bit of time in the company archives of novartis the, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world today which uh, which swallowed uh, sandos the um, the company where lsd was invented uh, a few years ago but i did find uh, the documents that now explain kind of the early history of lsd and makes us get a better you know clearer picture of why LSD now is illegal, a substance that now a lot of startups in America are saying this is this is this can help against dementia, it, it can help against uh, trauma, trauma diseases, yeah. um, it can help against depression. So why is this why is this substance not being examined more properly? Why is it illegal? And the reasons are to be found in tripped in, in those in those early um, years of LSD uh, after 1943 when it was discovered. Your mother helped open this door, didn't she? She she planted that seed for you to do this journalism. Well, at first, the book was called LSD for Mom, um, because when I started uh, researching it, I showed my father a white paper uh, of uh, an American startup company developing psychedelic compounds into medicines. And this white paper claimed that LSD in microdoses can be helpful um, against Alzheimer's disease, from which my mother is suffering. So we were discussing this in the family, and my father, a former judge and not exactly uh, a quote-unquote drug person, quite the opposite, actually. He said he studied this paper also, and he said, well, I have no med there's no medicine against Alzheimer's on the market. I think we should try it. But before we try it, I want you to thoroughly examine what this LSD is and why it's not in the pharmacy, what, ha what happened to it, what, ha what went wrong along the way. So this is... This is the motivation uh, for the book. And then in the end of the book, I come back to my father with the story. And then we in the family decide to um, uh, to, to take it uh, together with my mother in microdoses, microdosages. And um, the results were quite stunning, actually. There was a, uh, for us, you know, in the family, I'm not saying this happened, this works for everyone, but in our family, my mother suffering from Alzheimer's had uh, visible, uh, visible, uh, visible, very, very visible, like uh, cognitive uh, enhancements. She could speak better to us. She was in a better mood whenever she was and, and is on LSD. So th this book is a very personal book. Uh, unexpectedly, I, I, I thought I was just researching uh, the early history of the psychedelics, but then it did become a very personal book. And uh, I hope that also reflects in the writing of the book, which is you know not your normal nonfiction book, but a, a personal story, a personal research Trip, a historical detective story in a way. Yeah, yeah. What was that like for you? Because, I mean, to go in there and to dig. First of all, I love research. I love digging and putting my nose where it doesn't belong. So I'm actually very jealous of you for doing this project. <laughs> well, that was obviously the fun. I mean, I started this kind of type of work uh, with the predecessor, Blitz, which uh, examines Nazis and drugs. When I, for the first time, went into archives and really looked at documents, and later on, I learned that many historians actually don't go to archives and look at the original documents. They just read other books yeah. and, and make their own book out of other books. And this is this is obviously not proper research work. I also like to be in archives. They're very calm. Um, they're very you know, it's 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 almost like a meditation. But you you don't always find stuff. I mean, it's not also it's also quite tricky to be at archives. It's very time consuming can be horribly boring, but uh, <laughs> if you're a bit lucky, which I have been, 
in archives. It's it's immensely interesting, and it can you know help you write books. You know, it's so interesting, Norman, and I'm one of the guilty party here. I always associated LSD with the U.S. government breaking down on the people of Compton, California, and that, you know, and and that's where that issue uh, came up. And so, I mean, that's why I love this book is because it's like, no, there's a there's a much deeper story here, dude. Yeah, I mean, we, we usually don't uh, associate LSD with the mid and late 40s, but that is that is where it actually happened. That That is where the epic conflict between the company who developed it, the chemist who actually found it, Albert Hoffman, the American interests, first the American military and then the CIA, where they where they clash and where they mm-hmm. where, where it is defined what course LSD will be uh, will, will be going because Sandoz had high hopes with LSD. They set up a they called it a, an intoxication room within the company where company uh, people like bookkeepers or chemists or you know, people work, you know, working for Sunders could go and they, they would receive uh, dosages of LSD. They could say if they want a little or more. They were just sitting there and uh, looking out the window and describing their experiences. And their experiences were, all of them were great. Like everyone loved it. They, they had a good feeling. They could think better. They were in a better mood. So Sunders, the company, then they tested it on depressed depressed people, and also they had good effects. Yeah. So the company thought this is a this is a game changer. This is like we have so many mental and health mental mental health problems, especially after you know World War II with all its the trauma it created. We can ha- we have something now. We can give something. This is for therapy. This is for the for the you know for people for people's minds. This is good. You know. So they they thought it would make a lot of money with it. Uh, but they had made a mistake. The CEO had made a mistake because while the Nazis were still in power, he had communicated with his best buddy, who was a German living in Heidelberg, who was actually working to develop uh, biochemical weapons for Hitler. So, so the Nazis knew about LSD. This this had been uncovered before. Before I, I researched this, no one had ever written about this. But it's it's quite important because. Since the Nazis were so interested in it, they set up uh, a test a series in the concentration camp of Dachau, giving mm. people psychedelic inmates, you know, mm. prisoners, psychedelic uh, compounds unwittingly, and then checked if that could, you know, destroy their minds or you know, make them reveal all secrets, stuff like that. So that became very interested, interesting to the American military when they liberated Dachau, and then to the American intelligence service CIA in '47, uh, because. At that time, the Cold War was going on, and now the Americans were looking for a truth serum or a drug that could, you know, control someone's mind or open up someone's mind. Uh, uh, so, so because the Nazis were interested, the Americans got interested, and because the American state, especially the CIA, was so interested in LSD as a potential weapon, LSD didn't get the chance to develop uh, to to reach the American market because the CIA put pressure on Sanders. CIA operatives went to, flew to Basel uh, to the to the headquarters of Sandoz, uh, pressured Sandoz not to release this as a medicine, not to sell this uh, openly. And the company actually, you know, basically did what the CIA asked. The CIA had the FDA, you know, they were together. Like the, wow. it was, it was a powerful. They, they were powerful, you know, to they they, they were able to to make Sandoz kind of um, not put this on the market. You know, it, what what really fascinates me here is the fact that we all know that the Nazis were heavy, heavy duty into research. So to, to use them on someone, to locate information, how did it really affect them? You mean the Nazis, what they actually did with the psychedelics? Yeah, I see, because I would love to see, okay, we're going to try this amount of dose today. Tomorrow we're going to try this amount of dose. I mean, they were research, I mean, they really knew how to research, but I know they didn't go in there with just heavy doses of LSD. They had to have done the research to know what kind of control they've got. Well, the Nazis, as you said, were obsessed with um, with science. Um that's why the Americans had a special unit attached to the military called Alsos, and Alsos was responsible when uh, the American forces went into Germany to interview German scientists, to locate them and interview them first about uh, nuclear uh, technology, with, because the Nazis were also trying to develop a nuclear bomb. They failed. But the Americans thought for sure they have knowledge, which then they you know, collected. And the other thing they were, the Americans were interested in was biochemical weapons. And this is where also the Nazis' drug research led into. So in Dachau, 
they invited uh, prisoners um, to a cup of coffee, an SS officer named Plötner, he was this one guy, like a doctor who was in the SS, he was conducting these this research. He had a, a, a coffee with a prisoner, and in the coffee was a psychedelic compound, and he didn't tell the, the prisoner about it, and then he was you know, trying to develop questions after like half an hour when the drug would take effect that would convince, or like a technique of talking that would convince uh, the prisoner that his mind is, you know, fully mm-hmm. readable to the person in front of him because, in fact, he's like going insane because suddenly in his mind uh, a lot of things are happening. He doesn't know why because he doesn't even know he's had a drug because LSD is odorless and tasteless. So these were unethical human experiments, uh, you could say. Um, but they started quite late in the war, so the Nazis never really developed LSD as a truth serum. I think it's impossible actually to do so, but the Americans didn't know so. American military thought they started it and you know it's a very potent substance maybe we have to perfect the research they sent the the SS reports uh, to Harvard University where a professor called Beecher was responsible for the for the US military to evaluate what the Nazis were researching and then his report uh, came back to to Washington and landed on the desk uh, of a CIA uh, operative Sidney Gottlieb who was heading the MK Ultra program and who, who then got very interested in how can LSD be used as a weapon in the in the new in the new Cold War that was starting then. For example, could you poison the water supply of oh, a wow. Wow. Russian battleship with LSD? Not poison, but you know, make everyone, you know, trip out of their minds and make the crew you know, not not functionable. So that that wasn't that was a question they asked, or just in a in an interrogation. If you give someone a lot of LSD, can you destabilize that person? Can you, you know, over you know, can can you overpower that person? So they there were lots of questions that um, uh, Sidney Gottlieb uh, worked on, and then you know a lot of uh, LSD was being tested in the United States on patients in prisons, mm. but also. Uh, also outside, like anyone could have actually uh, become a victim because they, the CIA set up safe houses in New York and San Francisco and then invited people from like Bohemian bars in Greenwich Village to you know join for a private party in an apartment and then LSD was given unwittingly and then people were examined and evaluated and uh, so the, the unethical tests that the Nazis started were sad to say, uh, uh, reinvented or continued by the CIA. And that really was the opposite of what Sandoz, Sandoz, the company, wanted for their LSD. Like LSD was now evaluated as a weapon and not as yep, a medicine. Yep, yep. So this is this is actually where the problem started. And only now um, we're looking again at these uh, compounds and think talking about legalizing some of them or you know at least being able to research them and to see whether they are beneficial to mankind or actually as dangerous as the CIA wanted, wants us to believe they are. Mm. When you say weapon, are we talking chemical warfare, therefore would that be a war crime for using LSD? Probably no, it would be. Um, I mean, it's not a nerve gas that kind of kills you. So actually, the American military was interested in a quote-unquote human weapon. Like, let's say, uh, you know, an army attacks you and you're somehow able to put that, you know, to make that army trip. You know, you're you're not going to kill them, but still you could, you would win the battle against them because someone on high LSD is not, you know, a, a, a division would not be able to function as a division if they were all on LSD. So I don't know. I mean, technically, it might be a war crime, um, but practically, it, 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 it actually wouldn't be so. I mean, it, it, it's obviously, you know, using and warfare in itself, you know, what weapons are allowed, which, which weapons are not allowed. Right. Using LSDs is, is, is like a mad, is like a mad idea. I, I, I don't know. I, I never thought of it as a war crime. But I think certainly the war on drugs, which resulted from this kind of behavior, is is like a war crime in itself because it criminalizes uh, millions of people, not only in the United States, but also outside, puts people in prisons that basically did nothing except consume molecules that 
the American government uh, at one point considered, you know, inappropriate because they would leave. They were also used, for example, a lot during the anti-Vietnam war movement. A lot of yep, yep. hippies were using LSD. So it's hard to like put someone in jail because he has long hair, he or she has long hair. But if you know that that person is using LSD, then and you make LSD illegal, it's actually possible to 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 go against uh, minorities or groups. So the, the 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 war on drugs is basically it's 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 not it's on it's it, it has an ideological footing, not a not as it's not it's not on it's not on a scientific it's not based on scientific knowledge, and that that is the problem. And I think that is the big crime that came out of this development that I describe in Tripped. Yeah. You know, interesting how cannabis is becoming legal in so many states across the nation. Here in the Carolinas, what's happened is the Cherokee Nation now can legally sell cannabis. And and, and what you've unveiled inside your book is that psychedelic drugs can actually help in better ways than cannabis. So it's like, okay, is there any way that science can get together and create something that is less damaging and more effective? Well, the United States as democratic society should based should base its laws on scientific findings and scientific findings show um, that psychedelic compounds uh, help are helpful uh, against uh, depression dementia yes. trauma trauma uh, related diseases for example we in our family we were using LSD micro, in micro dosages against the Alzheimer's disease of my mother with uh, great success actually. First, I wanted to call the book LSD for Mom because that personal aspect that I also describe in the book now in the epilogue um, was really special to me when I when I worked on this book because I was just interested at first in the early history of psychedelics because I didn't understand why psychedelics became illegal mm-hmm. and what actually happened. So that was like a, a rational interest in it. But then when my mother developed Alzheimer's and we discussed it in the family, um, we thought that this uh, actually has... Uh, uh, it became very personal, and it became you know the most intense book so that I've worked on so far. And I'm I'm quite happy about it that I could actually help my mother wow. by writing a book. Wow! And the name of that book is Tripped. Are you going to be doing a speaking tour at all? I certainly hope so. Um, I'm I'm very much looking forward to to coming to the U.S. in spring. Uh, so we have we have to check with the uh, the publisher what dates they have arranged. I love it because, man, I would love to sit down and have a face to face with you because you I love people who dig in and get the story. And you you have definitely done that. Thanks a lot. Please come back to the show anytime in the future, Norman. The door is always going to be open for you. That's that's great to hear. Thanks a lot and have a wonderful day. You be brilliant. OK, sir. Yes. Thank, thank you. you.